Hey everybody, thanks for listening. This is episode 18 of the Fierce Fiduciary Podcast. I'm Brian Beasley and with me is Tom Stesich. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, Brian. Standard housekeeping, everything in the, this podcast is for informational or educational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast should be deemed personal financial planning advice or personal investment advice. For that, please seek out a properly registered professional. I'm rather an expert on bad choices. I've made so many over the years, from unhealthy food choices to postponing exercise, today's bad choice, and yes, even regrettable investment choices. And then I've observed so many bad choices on the part of my seven teenagers. Thankfully, now just down to one. But these days, I get to watch my grandkids learn to navigate the world. Teenagers have a remarkable ability to make the easy choice today and postpone the hard and difficult choice until tomorrow. And some of us grow up having perfected that ability, making even more bad choices as adults. I have interviewed hundreds of investors over the years, from small and starting out to having arrived billionaires. I'm always amazed by the mistakes they make and the inventive rationale they use for having made them. As a nation and a world, we've made numerous bad choices, taken the easy road, and ended up in the worst global economic crisis in 80 years. Now we are faced with a set of difficult choices as we work our way back to a new normal. History is replete with bad choices by both individuals and nations. In the past few decades, the new science has emerged that has taken note of the fact that not only are we sometimes irrational, but we are predictably irrational. This new behavioral science has started looking at how we go about making decisions and is finding all sorts of interesting, if sometimes distressing, things about the human species. It seems that our emotions and much of our decision-making process is hardwired into our brains, developed for survival on the African savannas some 100,000 years ago. We adapted to movement, learning to make decisions quickly, because there was quite a difference, literally, life and death, between dodging dangerous lions and chasing succulent antelope. And while those survival instincts are quite useful in general, when translated into a modern world, and especially a modern investment world, they make us prone to all sorts of errors. Think of chasing momentum all too often in the hope that it will continue, and running from falling markets just as they start to turn. What works for survival in the African jungles is not as productive in the jungles of world finance. Happily, we are not just homo mistakus. If we had learned to make nothing but bad choices, our species would have been consigned to the dustbin of history long time ago, making room for some survivors less prone to error. We clearly learned to make good choices as well and to learn from our mistakes and even the successes and wisdom of others. As I mentioned earlier, I have formally interviewed hundreds of millionaires. I am even more fascinated by choices they made that were the good and sometimes brilliant ones and the processes they used to make them. As a human species, there is much to be admired about Homo sapiens. We are capable of great work, soaring ideas, and wonderful compassion, all the results of good choices. And behavioral science is helping us to understand how we make those choices. Many of us are looking to the new world of behavioral finance for answers to our investment conundrums. By understanding ourselves and the way we make decisions, we can often create our own systemic, systematic process for making the right choices. Whereas we once seemed to be adrift in an ocean of potential choices with our emotions often dictating the final outcome, with the right tools, we can learn to set a confident course to that safe port of call. The problem is that behavioral finance can seem a little daunting, full of studies and inferences and not tied together very well. Until now, that is. My good friend James Montier, who literally wrote the book on behavioral finance called Behavioral Finance, Insights into Irrational Minds and Markets, has now put his considerable knowledge into this small little book of behavioral investing. I am no stranger to James's work. He and I worked on a lengthy chapter on behavioral finance for my book, Bullseye Investing. I thought I was familiar with the subject, but taking the little book on a plane ride was one of the best investments of reading time I've had in years. I found myself on all too many occasions sadly admitting to myself, that's me, and sighing, vowing never again to make that mistake. But at least now I know what to avoid, and I can work to improve my habits. This is a book that I am going to have to read often, at least annually. Thankfully, James has made the book fun and the subject interesting. His naturally wry humor comes through. 
whether learning why we can't seem to sell when we should or why we choose to we choose our price targets, James gives us a blueprint for becoming better investors in 16 little chapters full of insight. No more homo mistakes. I suggest you put this book at the top of your reading pile and keep it near your desk so that you can refer to it often to help keep you calm in the heat of decision, the decision-making moment. So sit back and let James help bring out your inner Spock. That is a foreword by John Malden, who is uh, introducing a book called The Little Book of Behavioral Investing, How to Not Be Your Own Worst Enemy, a 2010 book by James Montier. And we're going to jump into this today because it's the behaviors that we focus on on this podcast. The whole thing is about helping people make better decisions and and get better results from making good decisions. And it all is behavioral. So much of it is controllable. And I'll start off here in the beginning. In the introduction, he talks about Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing. He was the mentor for the famous Warren Buffett. He says, the investor's chief problem and even his own worst enemy is likely to be himself. And he talks here about there's evidence of this. There's an annual study by Dalbar every year that looks at the performance of mutual funds and then the performance that the investors in those mutual funds received. And if you look over the last 20 years, and this is the the 20 years ending in 2010, so 1990 to 2010, the S&P 500 generated about 8% on average each year. And then active managers have subtracted about 1% or 2% from this. And you might think that individual investors would have gotten 6 or 7%. Seems reasonable. But it turns out that the equity fund investors managed to reduce that to a paltry 1.9%. That number, even though I know it, shocks me every time I hear it. I, it's, it's, it's so different that it's almost hard to believe. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it's, it, it blows my mind, but the data is the data. And I, I'm not sure if they're still doing that Dalbar study every year. I haven't seen it lately popping up. But the point they're trying to make here is that the choices that we all make, we are all susceptible to errors. If the active professionals are not doing as well as their benchmark indexes on average, they're doing something wrong. And it's not just necessarily trading costs and taxes. It's There's other factors in, in there. And it's human factors. It's human decisions. And that's the point of this whole book. The good news, they say here, is that it doesn't have to be this way. And I'm just going to skip around here. The bottom line is we all seem to have some sort of a blind spot with various biases. And this is the basic foundation, I think. you got to admit that you're going to be susceptible to blind spots and biases. There's people out there who think, oh, no, I've got this. And that you, that's a lot of hubris. We all are susceptible. Everybody is. And I, I think the first step in, in being successful is that you have to admit you're susceptible to making a mistake, making the error. That humility is critical. Yeah, and you're probably going to make errors, not know it, and do it often. Back to the book here. Very often we end up trusting our initial emotional reaction, and only occasionally do we re-recruit our our logical part of our brain. He talks about two different parts of our brain. He talks about it in a Star Trek analogy of you've got um, McCoy, Dr. McCoy, who's highly emotional and you have Mr. Spock, who's completely logical. And we all have two parts to our brain. And he goes into the psychology of this with all kinds of, uh, psychological examples and proof from studies that have been done. But the, the bottom line is we trust the emotional side of our brain greatly. That's what's helped keep us alive. You know, going back to those savannas, in in Africa when we're running away from wild animals you don't have time to sit and think for something through necessarily and you trust that that's what's kept us alive it's hardwired into our system but a lot of our errors can be avoided by taking a step back and detaching from the situation and reviewing your decisions from a more rational and logical part of the brain or or by engaging somebody else that's a little less emotionally attached to the situation when it comes to your money it comes to your investments that's going to happen. You're going to get emotionally involved. 
as Warren Buffett said, investing is simple, but not easy. That is to say, it should be simple to understand how investing works effectively, but we can't help ourselves. Even professional investors can make these errors. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to ingrain better behavior into your investment approach. And that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's what he's introducing here. So the first, I'm going to chapter one is talking about in the heat of the moment. And this is the McCoy brain stuff. Yeah. In the heat of the moment. And when he's talking about the heat of the moment, it comes down to, you don't want to have to plan for an emergency. The instant it shows up, you don't want to have to think through all your options for emergencies or surprises when they happen. You need to be ahead of that. You should have already thought it through and planned ahead. And that's the case he's making. And that part of your brain might not very well be able to even do that. Think of all those things. The emotional absolutely cannot because all you're left with is yourself. And he talks about this, you, the, the title of, of, of chapter one called in the heat of the moment. And this, the subtitle, I guess, of the chapter is prepare plan and pre commit to your strategy. So when times are quiet, you're safe at home. It's not when you're going on a journey to a dangerous country, let's say Somalia, you probably want to do some homework before you make that journey. Well, going out into the risky markets is, it's not life or death, but you're risking your life savings or a portion of them anyway. You should prepare, you should plan, and you should pre-commit. And a big piece of what happens in when people are, are in the heat of the moment is they've procrastinated. And when you when you put things off, you're actually setting the stage that you're going to have that emergency panic type situation and you're going to make a bad decision. You should have planned ahead. And so if you, you say, okay, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to set to put together my financial plan, my strategy, my investment plan, my investment policy statement for my accounts or whatever it may be. I'm going to sit down and do this. We all know everybody puts that off to the last minute. What psychologists have found is that imposed deadlines are very effective. So if you find yourself procrastinating, set yeah, a deadline. Three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks. Make sure it's something regular and you can commit to. Saying you can get it done one year from now might not be the best deadline. 100%. 100%. Now, what about pre-commitment? He has a saying here, and we've heard variations on this. It says, this is a variation on something I've heard elsewhere, but it says perfect planning and preparation prevent piss poor performance. They call it the seven P's. And I've heard proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance, but perfect planning and preparation when it comes to your finances can prevent. So that is to say, you got to do your research when you're in a cold, rational state and nothing much is going on. You don't want to be doing your planning and research in the midst of, let's say, I don't know, uh, the Dow Jones industrial average being up or down a thousand points a day in either direction in March, in the midst of a surprise pandemic. And you're trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to reorient? You, you just can't, you need to be in a place where you can be rational and as rational as possible, the quietest time, that's when you should be doing your research. And then you need to pre-commit to following your own analysis and any prepared action steps. So just like if you're going to go on that trip to Somalia, you need to be doing some research about, okay, um, the State Department, what, what, what's going to be dangerous for me? What are some things I need to think about? What kind of close? What's the weather going to be like? It's going to be hot. <laughs> but also we know that's a dangerous place. So you need to be thinking about those things. What if this? What if that? And if you're going to be a traveler in the investment world, that's what they're talking about here in this book is that you, you need to plan ahead. Uh, Sir John Templeton talked about, he was well known for saying the time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy. And the time of maximum optimism is the best time to sell. And the challenge with that is that we're all hardwired to go along with the crowd. The best time to buy is when everybody else is scared, is what he's saying. Yeah, and that's really difficult because when everybody else is scared, that fuels your fear when everybody's excited that fuels your excitement it's very tough to get out of that that mind frame of following what everybody else is going to do it's incredibly challenging and you, we, we've seen it we've been through multiple large bear markets at least in my career with people uh, the 2000 to 2002 bear market lasted 
God, it seemed like two and a half years. It was horrible. Just dragged on and on and got worse and worse and worse. And you think, is this ever going to recover? And the tendency is people want to just at a certain point, after so many negative statements in a row, they're done. They're like, I don't even care about logic. I don't care about anything. My emotional is taken over completely and I'm not prepared for this. I was prepared for like a three month bear market or a one month bear market, but you know, gosh, it's been like two years and that's pretty unusual, but it has happened. And then you fast forward a few years, you look at 2008 and the market dropped 50, over 50% in a short period of time. Very I think it was like about 17 months. Mm -hmm. And even that 17 months, it's a long time. And we had people that had not lost money that still bailed on their conservative investments just out of fear alone mm -hmm. back in 2008. It's like, I can't take this. And they're, they've made money or they maybe didn't lose a lot of money, but they were not even remotely as much in the stock market as yeah. the news would say, but they just couldn't handle the news. If you have no plan, you're, 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 you're real hot water. Even if you did have a plan sticking to it's difficult too. So it's not you creating a plan, but then having the, the willpower to stick with your plans. That's, that's difficult too. You don't want, you just won't, don't want to be caught flat footed in the heat of the moment. And that's the point of the whole initial chapter is that, listen, you're all, things are going to happen. You need to have thought this through. What if the worst case happens? What if the best case happens? What if you see all of a sudden everybody in the world is crazy optimistic about something that you know is, or you believe in your heart, or even the math tells you is patently not sustainable. Can you, what's, what are you going to do in that situation? If there's a bubble like the dot com bubble happened, what if that something like that happened again? So you, you got to be thinking not only about the worst case scenario, but you also have to consider what would you do in the best case scenario when all of a sudden everything looks like it's, you know, unicorns and rainbows. And generally speaking, it's not. You need to have a plan of action. So chapter two, who's afraid of the big, bad market? And he's talking here about in reinvesting when you're terrified. So this is a situation, and this book came out in 2010. So this is on the heels of the 2008 financial crisis disaster. They're talking, a lot of people made some really bonehead decisions back in the 2008 crisis. And one of the common things was, when are we going to get back in? There are people had reached their limit sometime between the peak of 2007 and the bottom of March of 2009. Some of those people said, I'm out, sell me out. But then what? When do you tiptoe back in or just get back in? That's, that's a tough one. So he talks about a really simple game here and you can play this with yourself just to see how you're mentally it goes. But if it's at the start of the game, you're given $20. So this is one of the psychological experiments that Montier's talking about here. You're given $20, and the game lasts 20 rounds. At each round, you're asked if you'd like to participate and invest. You either say yes or no. And then a fair coin is flipped. If it comes up heads, you get $2.50. It costs you a dollar to play. But if you... If it comes up heads, you get $2.50 back. So you get your dollar back and a dollar fifty plus on top of that. If it comes up tails, though, you just lose the dollar you gave. So if it's tails, you lose a dollar. So worst case scenario, all tails down 20 bucks. Correct. Worst case scenario is you get 20 tails in a row and you're, you've lost your money. And so you play this game and, and, and they've done this with various people. And throughout this game, what surprised me about this is in all these experiments, they found that there were a lot of people that were trying, that were playing less than hundred percent of the time. Far less. Yeah. Like 61% of the time or 58% of the time. And even, even the people who were called themselves fearless or they'd, they'd shown through previous experiments that they didn't have, they couldn't feel fear. Yeah. I believe in some of the study, people had brain damage to their fear centers. That's what it was. Yeah. That's what it was. So, even they are only playing 85% of the time. 85% of the time, yeah. So the math on that, for those of you who, who are, you know, I'll save you the effort of going through some calculus. If you play every round and it's a fair coin where it's 50-50, you're going to make, you're going to end up with 25 bucks at the end. That's the, if, Mate, you, if yeah. you played 100% of the 20 rounds, then odds are you're going to end up with around 25 bucks. We played a couple rounds. I got, what, 23 
Yeah, you got like twenty three fifty, I think, yeah. and I got uh, I lucked out and got twenty seven fifty on mine. I think if we did it over and over, you'd probably have a bell curve right around that twenty five dollars, yeah. because it's a if it's a fair coin, it's going to be fifty percent of the time heads, fifty percent of the time tails. Yeah. What was funny is when we were doing these, it would come up tails, 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 and it kind of tests your what wherewithal if you want to keep playing, and then finally you'd go heads, heads, and it would even out. Yeah, it was pretty close. Yeah. And you, if some people <laughs> believed if they chose correctly in the beginning where they wouldn't play, they thought they were very good at playing and had more confidence in their ability to time heads or tails, which was very interesting. And this, he talks about this in the, in the book a little bit too. Is you translate that over to the investment markets, fear causes people to ignore bargains when they're available. So, for example, if you saw tails, 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 I mean, the odds are a fair coin's gonna come up heads. At some point. So at some point, it's these people who were not playing are going to be tempted to get back in. Now, in the investment world is kind of different, though, because when they see tails, 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 they think, oh, it's just going to keep going tails. Right. Now, you and I know in the game, it was a fair coin. You're going to have half the time is going to the heads are going to come back up. But it does kind of mess with you a little bit if you're playing that game because you're kind of going, do I really? And it's it's just a hypothetical game. Yeah. After the third or fourth uh, tail in a row, you're going, ooh. Maybe I should hold off this time. And there's that was one of the things they found is if somebody lost, they were far less likely to bet the next round. And that's exactly the way it works in the investment world. So it, it, if people had previously suffered a loss, and the longer they find themselves in that position, then the worse their decision-making becomes. I'll say that again. The longer they find themselves in this position, the worse their decision-making appears to become. So you get one negative statement in a you know, in the mail on your investment account, and it's down. And the markets were down too. Say that's like March of 2020, COVID. And you think, oh, okay. And then April comes back, and there was a recovery. And you're like, oh, okay. I guess that wasn't that big of a deal. But I can tell you from experience, if you're an investor and you get three statements in a row that go down, then you're calling somebody on the phone and saying it's going. And I don't know why this is, but everybody says it exactly the same way. We need to talk because it's going down, down, down. And they say the word down three times in a row. It's not two. It's not four. It's always down, down, down. And it's always after the third negative statement arrives in the mail. I, I don't, I can't explain why that is, but two is a coincidence. Three is a pattern. Yeah, that seems to be the, the, the case. And so we'll find reactions to that is uh, it has been studied and, and it is it is an interesting thing he talks a little bit here about brain drain and your performance. So if you're trying to make better decisions, you don't want to be fried. If, if you are emotionally fried, um, it's going to affect your ability to make good decisions. And they they found people. They tried to measure people about how how much they relied on that emotional Dr. McCoy side of their brain. And they'd ask them questions like, and find, you know, do you agree or disagree with various statements? Like, I tend to use my heart as a guide for my actions, or I like to rely on my intuition, or I don't have a very good sense of intuition, but whether they agree or disagree. And they'd find out who's more quick and dirty and who's more deliberative and logical in their decision-making process. And what they found was, is the people who are really used to doing everything quick and dirty, they run out of self-control faster hmm. than those who are more inclined to use their logical thinking systems. Now we all have them. So this is all teachable. It's all habit development, but the more quick and dirty you are, the more intuitive you tend to be in your decision-making process. And there's even books on this that have been bestsellers like Blink and and how do you just, just quick and dirty. But the thing is, is like under stress, you run out of steam and you start making errors. And so there's, there's just, there's all this evidence of the dangers of relying up upon our own abilities to make decisions. It's, it's like demons that we carry with us. And it's just a fascinating, um, a fascinating thing that can come. You just need to be aware. Hey, where this is all leading to is it, it leads to, you need to be more logical in your thinking. 
there's another thing that occurred in 2009 and it happens in other markets if they're extended bear markets at some point people find themselves temporarily paralyzed Mm -hmm. and that's a horrible place to be in that guessing game world where you got out or you've been thinking about investing, but now you're afraid and, and markets are down and the news is bad. And maybe the opportunities are phenomenal in terms of bargains and, and prices and things, but you still can't find it in yourself to take that. You can almost see it. There's so much information that the people have been bombarded with for so long that it's, they can't. They seem, they seem paralyzed. It's yeah. And in hindsight, you can look back at March of 2009 and go, holy cow, the Dow Jones industrial average was like under 7,000. Yeah. Like, what were you doing? Why weren't you buying? I'm in the same boat. I mean, I was listening to people who were scared to death and I was just trying to keep my clients, you know, emotions at bay. And even then, we still had some level of, of reinvestment happening, but Back then, you look back in hindsight and you go, oh my gosh, had you known it was going to go to 29,000 by the end of 2019, 10 years later, you know, goodness. I mean, it was, a, it was a very trying time because at that moment in time, and people don't remember, people have a short memory. And there's even people listening to this podcast that maybe they were children at that time. But there were people quite literally concerned that the entire banking system was going to completely shut down that banks would be closed. You couldn't get into the banks to even get your, the power would be turned off. That'd be it. And everybody'd be on their own. I had a, there was, I was at a meeting at a very large money management firm on the West coast. And there was a, uh, one of the key managers there was looking at the situation earlier in the crisis. And it was a whole room full of advisors in this big, big room. And they said, Hey, you've been talking about all these bad things going on. What do we tell our clients? And the guy says they shouldn't be investing in bottled water and canned goods. That was the mentality going on back then. So the fear across every level from the institutional money managers all the way to the people on the street was panic. And even though you look back on it and go, Oh, it's totally, you know, hindsight's 2020. No, it's, we're still here. <laughs> We're all still here. Back then, it was a very, very real thing. And it was much worse than what we were experiencing in COVID in terms of the mental part of it, from what I've seen anyway, um, with people being truly concerned about if, if the world was even going to be around anymore. It was, there was all kinds of cr- crazy extreme talk. But when that happens, people get paralyzed. And there's only back to the book here. There's only one cure for this terminal paralysis. You absolutely must have a battle plan for reinvestment and you have to stick to it. Since every action must overcome paralysis, what I recommend is a few large steps. He says, not many small ones because each decision requires effort. Right. So he says, have a plan where you, you have very specific situations that occur. And if this, then I'm going to invest this amount. And if that, I'm going to invest that amount. And you're going to have a process and a system for getting yourself back invested. The worst place you can be is in this guessing game world where you're trying to say, do I get in? Do I get out? Do I wait? Do I not wait? That's hell. You can't live there for very long because you're, eventually the world's going to pass you by one way or the other. And by the time you get your confidence, it could be, oh, the party could be over already. And we've seen that too, where people start getting excited near the tops. Yeah. You're waiting for everybody else to be jumping on the bad wagon and getting back in. And then that's, that's, you've missed it. The other thing he mentions here is it's particularly important to have a clear definition of what it will take for you to be fully invested. The battle plan for reinvestment is a schedule of pre-commitments that acknowledges both the empathy gap we will encounter and also helps remove the fear-induced terminal paralysis that we are most likely to be suffering. So one of the strategies for maintaining rational thinking at all times is to attempt to avoid the extreme stresses that lead to the poor decision-making in the first place. So he talks about a couple of those. One is, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit. He talks about this um, this empathy gap. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really dive into the empathy gap specifically, but what I think he's talking to talk about here is that if if you're trying to reinvest in a time when everybody else is talking about canned goods and bottled water, 
if you tell other people that, Hey, I'm thinking about getting back into the market. I, I can tell you, you're going to feel pretty lonely yeah. in, in a situation like that. And so that empathy gap is something you have to be prepared for. You have to be prepared to be um, maybe making a decision that's different than what everybody else is making. And that's, that's very hard for people to, to do. But he also discusses some of these, these ways. If you're going to, you don't want to put yourself in a position where your portfolio is structured in a way where now you have extreme stress. And w the way I try to describe that is that if your portfolio, it, it needs to be aligned with your goals, but it also needs to be aligned with you and your tolerance for the ups and downs, your risk tolerance, if you will. And what, what, we, what we tell people is if your portfolio is way more aggressive than you're comfortable with, you're going to love the returns when things, when times are good. But the problem there is that if you have a really bad time, like a big bear market hit, it's going to rock your world because you were taking more risk than you thought you were. And when it goes, it's going to go down so fast and so much more than what you were comfortable with that you're more likely to make a bad decision in panic and sell out near a low if you took too much risk on the front end. On the flip side of that coin, if your portfolio is too conservative, you might be very fortunate in those down times and say, oh, look, I didn't go down that much. But then after a while, if, if things start doing very, very well and you're not doing as well, there's that, I need guess. need to catch up with the group. I got to catch up. I got to get more aggressive. And at that point, by the time you reach that conclusion, many cases you're buying at or near a market high and you're buying high. And so what, what he's talking about here is you need to have some strategies for making sure you avoid any extremes in that are outside of your own comfort zone. Yeah. Cause like hitting on each one of those extremes is why people are getting a return of 2% versus 8%. They're buying high. They're selling low. They're buying high. They're selling low. I feel confident because look how well it's doing. I think I'll buy now. And then it goes down. Oh my God, it went down. It's going down. And so then so, they get out so. because it's going down and then it goes back up and it's just, they get whipsawed all over the place. This is, I mean, we took, we, I harp on people all the time. There's no such thing as present tense. When you're talking about the stock market, there's nothing that's doing anything. It either just did something or it's about to do something. This isn't a bank CD where you have a guaranteed rate of return that you're signing up for. Just because it says it's something did 17% for the last three years doesn't mean it's going to keep doing 17%. There's that little disclaimer that's somewhat common at the bottom of... Common. <laughs> somewhat common. You know, past performance is no indication of future results. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Your mileage may vary. You know, <laughs> it, it's it's so common that people are no longer they don't pay attention to it, and it's very 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 real. But what are some other strategies that he mentions in the book? Here is the willingness to hold cash in the absence of a compelling investment opportunity. So what's that mean? It's like, hey, that's, until I get a good enough deal, I'm not buying. I'm going to wait for the fat pitch. If I'm playing baseball, I'm not going to just swing at every single thing that goes by a strong sell discipline. Pretty common question we see on the Facebook groups for the, for the beginners is you know, when do I sell? How do I know when to sell? And all kinds of answers. And it's all unique to that person's situation, of course. I mean, but some people will say some, some of the amateurs will chime in and they'll say, never sell, never sell anything. You'll be fine. And other people will say, well, actually there's a point where you might consider saying, Hey, this is a, uh, absolutely no longer worth the risk that it's in it taking or now it's too big a portion of my portfolio or whatever but whatever that sell discipline is you should have a a strong discipline for what when you're making changes to your portfolio to have that set up before you even make the buy yes there was a um there was a movie with robert de niro called ronin greatest car chase movie greatest car, yeah they put the cameras right there on the early in the movie he, all these people meet up in this like diner restaurant or whatever, and they, they, they're all these hired guns that they've just, this is their first meeting. And they, they say, okay, now we're going to all going to go from here to the next place. And they're, now that we've all met, we're going to go to our headquarters or whatever, where we're going to plan our thing that we're going to be doing. And uh, Robert De Niro's character says, hang on a second. He walks around the back of the building and he retrieves a pistol that he had hidden at, near the back door of this, this diner. And the guy looks at him kind of funny and he says, Hey man, I never walk into a place that I'm not, that I don't know how to walk out of. 
you shouldn't buy an investment if you don't know how you're going to get out of it or when you're going to get out of it or why. The whole point of this, this whole book seems to be about having a plan. What are you going to do? Why are you going to do it? And if this, then that. And you, you have it all laid out before you even start so that you're not reacting to noise and you're not reacting to nonsense and you're not susceptible to making these human errors in decision-making process. The third one is significant hedging activity. That can be diversification or doing uh, other things to in, you know, manage the downside risks, sometimes some complicated things. And the other one is avoiding leverage. So you don't want to be making huge bets beyond what your portfolio can handle using borrowed money. That's leverage. If you're using borrowed money to make a trade, that's where you can be forced to sell well before you're ready. Yes. And you're just stacking the deck in your favor by following these basic little rules that are there. Chapter three titles it always look on the bright side of life. And that's a a line from the, one of the scenes in a, a Monty Python movie, the life of Brian. One of the things they talk about is how big of a deal that, you know, everybody's attracted to the optimist. No one wants to hang around with somebody who's like, oh, woe is me. We're all doomed. It'll never work. I mean, that, that's, that kind of stuff is not attractive. So we're all naturally attracted to the optimist. and We all want to be seen as an optimist. I mean, if you didn't believe that things were possible, you wouldn't continue moving forward. You lose hope. So hope is a very powerful thing. But what we, what we have is in, in the book here, he talks, this tendency to overrate our abilities is amplified by the illusion of control. We think we can influence an outcome. And so people often make, I'm skipping around here a little bit, people often mistake randomness for control. And the illusion of control seems most likely to con- occur when lots of choices are available, when you have early success at the task, like the coin tossing. Mm-hmm. If the task you are taking is familiar to you, if the amount of information is high and you have a personal involvement is, does that like maybe rhyme with like personal finance and people's investment accounts? Any of those factors? I think we may have hit them all on the head there, huh? Over optimism is one of those cognitive ability resistant biases. It, if you believe you can, I see it in brand new investors who are like, yeah, yeah, whatever, old man, this is the future. I know how this is going because look what's happened in the last three weeks. And they've got all this confidence and all this perspective, all this optimism that's there. And it, it is a great life strategy, but at the, at the end of the day, back to the book here, it says, however, hope isn't a good investment in strategy. Observation over, this is from Benjamin Graham, observation over many years has taught us that the chief losses to investors come from the purchase of low quality securities at times of favorable business conditions. The purchasers view the current good earnings as equivalent to earnings power and assume that prosperity is synonymous with safety. In other words, Everything's going great in the economy. A rising tide lifts all boats and some of the boats don't deserve to be rising, but they float. That doesn't mean they have a motor. doesn't mean they can sustain a storm, but everything's going well. And, uh, and people who buy low quality stuff in good times usually end up having the, the biggest losses. He talks about the self-serving bias. They're talking about stock market research here. It says, if you look at stockbroker research, it generally conforms to three self-serving principles. The idea being, you look at these analysts that put out these reports on individual stocks, for example. People don't get excited when you put a sell order or a sell recommendation on a stock, especially if that company is engaging your employer for some other services. So there's a self-serving bias there. So what they tend to do is all news is good news. Everything is always cheap, and assertion trumps evidence. So how do we beat over-optimism? You've got to learn to think critically and become more skeptical in everything you're doing. That's actually really hard. Yeah, I believe they said the only people that could be rational off the block were um, the clinically depressed in the book. Only people who are suicidal, near suicidal, are the ones that see the world for what it actually is. And that was that was a very, I thought, very interesting point of the book. 
So you're talking about overconfidence. The chapter four here, he talks about why does anybody even listen to these guys? Mm -hmm. He's talking about experts and in the book here, one of the most supported findings in psychology is that experts are generally even more overconfident than the rest of us. And we're already all very overconfident as it is. So people are already overconfident. That's an automatic bias. You're over optimistic. You're overconfident in your own abilities. But if somebody's an expert, then their ego gets involved. And the more alphabet soup after their name, the more ego sometimes. And the dangers are really there that they could make some errors. And he makes a contrast here between two different types of professionals. He's got weather pe- weathermen, is what he says in the book, meteorologists and doctors. And there were some experiments. But, you know, the weathermen are given weather patterns and tried to predict the weather based on the information available to them. And doctors were given case notes and asked to diagnose patients. What, what the net result was is that, well, the conclusion is our species has an unfortunate habit of using confidence as a proxy for skill. You know, the weatherman's going to be, well, well, there's a chance of this and a chance of that. And basically, I don't know for sure, but here's what it kind of looks like it's going to be. In all probability, they talk a lot in terms of probabilities, a 50-50 chance of rain. There's a 30% chance of the uh, high north of 60 or whatever it's going to be. And, you know, you talk, we live in the, here in the Chicagoland area. And, and in Chicago, uh, I saw a, a local meteorologist speak one time. He said, our area actually has five different climate zones that are covered by his broadcast area on his show. So he has to cover all bases for the most part in any broadcast. The weathermen are a little more humble and know what they don't know because they've seen so much. They've been wrong so many times. I think in the study, he was saying the weathermen said they would be right about half the time Mm -hmm. when they made their prediction about 50% of the time. I'll be right. The other time I'll be wrong. So the coin flip is what they were confident in saying. And the truth is there's, there's some humility there because they've been wrong. If you've been a typical doctor, straight a student, 4.0 grade point average, um, in some cases, uh, very successful in extracurricular leadership activities. By the time they get to the part where they're a practicing physician, they really know their stuff. I mean, they've been through a significant amount of education, a significant amount of stressful situations through uh, going through their residency and the whole bit. And honestly, they've they've kind of they've kind of earned their the ego to some extent. And, but yet the more confident they tend to be, the worse their decisions would tend to be. And that's just something, so you want to key in. And so he goes on talking about, he goes, why does anybody listen to Jim Cramer? So if you, if you don't know who he is, he has a very popular stock market show in the afternoons on, I think it's Fox Business Channel or CNBC, CNBC one of the others. What it turns out is that people prefer those who sound confident and are willing to pay more for confident but inaccurate advisors. So people will pay more for somebody who's actually inaccurate if they sound amazingly confident. Yeah, so those doctors, I think, in the study said with a nine, they were 90% confidence in their diagnosis. Um, and I think they were correct 15% of the time. The, if they got to the point where they were 90% confident, they were incorrect more often than not. That was like, you're right. It's like a 15% success rate with yeah. those doctors in the experiments that they did. And the case that's being made here is that we're susceptible to trusting anyone that believes they're an expert and we're susceptible to trusting and believing anybody that's highly confident. Now the, what the research shows is that we should temper that because the more confident that expert is in a lot of cases, the more they pound the, the table and say, here's what is going to happen. If it's just coming out of their brain and their quote experience or their genius, if the source of it is their magical clairvoyance, because they're just so such an expert odds are they're going to make some mistakes. Yeah. One of the the factors that a lot of the experts, when the the fact the experts come up a lot in the book, um, one of the was outside unrelated experience is what they quoted when they made their decisions. Um, and that was that was the factor that the novices, when making a decision, didn't have, and it, it led to errors. So, what do you mean by that? By outside, unrelated experience. So, it was the you know, I've been doing this for twenty years. I have a feel was kind of their description. Okay. So that was one of the big factors. That was the the, the Ron the Ron Swanson in the uh, 
in the Home Depot with his cart. Hi, sir. May I help you? He just looks at him and says, I know more than you. Yeah. It was, it was that kind of, it was, that was one of the factors they said that was the driver. Well, the danger to the rest of us is that when we're confronted with experts advice, it actually makes part of our brain turn off certain processes that are required for financial decision-making is what they're saying in the book here. And you got to be aware of that. So we have this other tendency to do what we're told and just, you know, Oh, somebody speaks with authority. You tend, we all tend to agree. Well, you know, she just knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. So I'll go ahead and go along with it because after all, she's the expert or, Hey, they're on TV. They must be brilliant. They must be a genius. They must know what they're talking about. Cause I'm not on TV. They obviously know more than me. I'll just listen to them and just go along with what you're told. And the challenge there is generally speaking, we know this through personal experience with, with our own former partner, your uncle, you know, who is on TV, the, the, the instructions that those people on TV get from the producers is whatever you do, say anything you want, but do not let them change the channel. The financial media is not there to provide fiduciary advice. They're there to keep people watching commercials. That's how they make their money. Yeah, they're, they're not fiduciaries. They actually tell you to, before you do anything, go ask somebody who is. Go ask somebody who is. So uh, bottom line is overconfidence can be hazardous to your, to your wealth and, 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 there's this other thing that, that they mentioned. I just want to make mention here is that so you'll sometimes hear somebody say that they, they believe they can outsmart everybody else. Effectively, they can get in before everybody else gets in and they can get out before the herd dashes for the exit. And the truth of the matter is, uh, no, they can't. Most people can't do that. And all the research has been shown. Nobody can outsmart everybody. Very, very, it's, it's almost so rare that one should not even try to outsmart people. And so that, you know, go ahead um, on this, this overconfidence thing The I want to, maybe we'll talk about it later, but the real interesting thing I, I thought was the more information somebody had, the more confident they became in their decision, even if that information was completely irrelevant or was the same information they had before just displayed differently. So just by having another piece of paper with facts and figures that mean nothing, you become more confident. So it's something to think about. If you're very confident in your portfolio, is it because you just have a lot of information on it? Or is it because of you know true due diligence? Yeah, or he, is it he, just another piece of... Is you a whole, just yeah. collected a lot of things about it and not quite understand it. Just because you have more, info, more information doesn't mean you should be necessarily more confident. And he does talk about this, you know, later on in the book. But you're right; you will run across people who subscribe to every periodical known to mankind, and they read it all every every weekend. I read, you know, whatever uh, weekly magazine for investing, and and I I know my stuff because I've been doing this for ten years, and it's completely irrelevant. Do you know what you're talking about, or why? And it's not it's not like meant to be a an affront to somebody who legitimately has been trying to study. It's just that we need to be able to be humble enough to step back and recognize, even even those of us who do this for a living, have to be humble enough to step back and realize we probably are prone to making mistakes. How can we stack the deck against us? So if we can't outsmart, this is just back to the book here, if we can't outsmart everyone else, how on earth can we invest? The good news is we don't have to outsmart everyone else. We need to stick to our investment discipline ignore the actions of others and stop listening to the so-called experts. And I'll add on TV in the periodicals or whatever, analysts picking stocks that people that predict things. That's the kind of expert I think of. Yeah. He goes in the book. It says talks more about experts in forecasting. That's where the real danger is. And that's the next chapter, the folly of forecasting prepare. Don't predict. You know what? One of the guidelines that we talk about is, probability not prediction you should just people there's so much energy put into trying to predict things and the fact is most people can't do it in fact the research shows nobody can do it unless they're consistently saying the same thing and eventually they're right you know if you say it's going to rain it's going to rain it's going to rain tomorrow it's going to rain tomorrow and eventually it's going to rain and you're going to say ah look i was right but it's better just to prepare instead of to try to forecast instead of try to predict. Lao Tzu observed, those who have knowledge don't predict. Those who predict don't have knowledge. 
kind of like that one, but there's a, there's layers to it. So it's like, hey, if, if if you have knowledge, you don't have to predict because you already know what's going to happen. But the other way of looking at it is just to say, hey, the people that really understand how the world works, they know they can't they know they can't predict anything. Yeah, well, so, I, I know so I, I can trying. predict the market. I'm gonna go up, down, or sideways. There's a limited <laughs> limited menu of options there. <laughs> Those for are sure. the options. It's uh, somebody asked. I can't remember who it was. Whether it was, Will Rogers or something like that. He says the market's going to fluctuate. Yeah. And it's kind of thing. The, you know, without, he goes into a lot more detail than we have time for here, but the evidence on the folly of forecasting is overwhelming. If you haven't you know, get the book, read the book. It's just, it is a fascinating read the consensus. I'm going to read a little bit from the book. The consensus of economists has completely failed to predict any of the last four recessions. Even once we knew we were in them, the analysts are no better. Their forecasting record is simply dreadful on both short and long-term issues. When an analyst first makes a forecast for a company's earnings two years prior to the actual event, they are on average wrong by a staggering 94%. Even at a 12-month time horizon, they are wrong by around 45%. To put it mildly, analysts don't have a clue about future earnings. You ever notice that very few firms put out the accuracy record and batting average record of their recommendations and their, their forecasts. And they laugh at you when you ask for them. Yeah. You want what? <laughs> you want what? Wait, what? What? You know, can we change the subject? And they, they'll, they'll move on. The bottom line from this whistle stop tour of the failure of forecasting is that it would be sheer madness to base an investment process around our seriously flawed ability to divine the future. We would all be better off if we took Keynes' suggested response when asked about the future. Quote, we simply do not know. I'm going to read that first part again. It would be sheer madness to base an investment process around our seriously flawed ability to divine the future. And how many people think that's the name of the game? That stock picker person 101, I can figure out what's going to be good. A month from now, two months from now, a year from now, two years from now. And a lot of times you hear that is from the the retail investor, you know. You you hear forecasts from analysts, but a lot of times they're just I mean it's they're doing their job and trying to predict and they basically all just end up agreeing with each other. So, well, you've done you've done some studies in this because you've gone further down the road in the an analysis mm -hmm. world than than I have, but at some point in making those forecasts and figuring out, it comes down to at some level, there's a point where don't you have to kind of make a guess? Yeah, you're guessing what the economy is going to be doing. How there is so many variables that it's almost ridiculous. Um, Probably explains some, why everybody's so wrong all the time. Yeah, it, looking at it, you you come up with a <laughs> expectation and. To the point where I thought it, it's almost silly <laughs> doing it. but So if we can't invest by forecasting, he says, how should we invest? Well, all investors should devote themselves to understanding the nature. This is, he's talking here about stocks, individual stocks. Now, for a lot of people, they'll never own an individual stock in their life. I mean, a basis for a lot of our portfolios do not involve individual stocks. We're using things like index funds and ETFs, exchange-traded funds, uh, that kind of thing. But in the book here, it says they should devote themselves to understanding the nature of the business and its intrinsic worth rather than wasting their time trying to guess the unknowable future. Rather than trying to forecast the future, why not take the current market price and back out what that implies for future growth? This implied growth can then be matched against a distribution of the growth rates that all firms have managed to achieve over time. If you find yourself with a firm that has that is at the very limits of what previous firms have achieved, then you should think very carefully about your purchase. So basically, what he's saying here is, if you're the, the traditional way from the Benjamin Graham book, the individual, the the, the uh, intelligent investor is, hey, figure out what the business is actually worth, and in order to do that, you got to make some assumptions in the, for the future growth. And there's other models that have come out, the dividend discount model, and whatnot, where you're making some sort of assumptions for few for the future. Mm -hmm. he, and what this guy's hypothesis is, hey, you don't even need to do that. Just look at where things are and figure out if if you apply those same formulas, you just solve for a different X. What growth rate are they assuming? And if it's insane, don't buy it. Maybe don't buy it. Or if it's if they're assuming things are going to be horrible on the other end of the spectrum, then maybe you have a bargain. There's there's just different ways of looking at it. Maybe just be very careful about buying that. 
think very carefully about buying something that's if it's that far on the extreme. Ben Graham's words that you don't need to know a person's exact weight to know whether they're overweight or underweight. He talks about here in the book. This is pretty true. And there's there's you know Keynes has it says it another way. He says I'd rather be approximately right than precisely wrong. And what's going on here? People are thinking, hey, if I can't figure it out a hundred percent accurate, then I'm I'm you know that's not good enough. I have to get to the point where I'm a hundred percent sure. And what these guys are saying is, Hey, you know, when you're, you know, when things are ridiculous and you know, when things are generally cheap and that probably is good enough to be effective over the long run, you don't have to be outsmarting everybody. And it's better to be mostly right than to be a hundred percent wrong. And I've seen people make these mistakes where they say, I'm going to put all my money into X, Y, Z. We have anecdotes from previous episodes where somebody put all their money, they got a second mortgage, they doubled down, they put even more money into something at the peak of the dot-com bubble and the whole thing collapsed 95%. Or they were highly confident in their employer stock and they put all their net worth into it right before they retired and the stock went down 95% or something ridiculous. You knew it was a bad decision, but they were so wanting to hit for the, get that home run hit that they, they couldn't, they couldn't not make that bad decision. They couldn't keep themselves from it. Here's where they were talking here in chapter six about the information overload that you were talking about earlier, distinguishing the signal from the noise. When it comes to investing, we seem to be addicted to information. The whole investment industry is obsessed with learning more and more about less and less until we know absolutely everything about nothing. Rarely, if ever, do we stop to consider how much information we actually need to know to make a decision. So is more better? Information makes you feel comfortable. I mean, makes you like feel a confident. safety blanket. Makes you makes you feel like you've done something because you've gone over 15 years of balance sheets and 10k filings on on Edgar. But it, what he's saying in the book here is that a lot of times less is more. And what they, they he talks about they did this with doctors. You know, we're picking on doctors a lot in this episode. So I put this book anyway. I, I, I I'll pause. He didn't pick on the doctors. The book is picking on doctors. Fair enough. They took doctors and they had them um, trying to diagnose various forms of cardiovascular disease and what the right treatment was going to be and when they needed to be admitted to the ICU instead of the normal ward. And what they found is that they were having a lot of problems because people were um, getting hospital transmitted illnesses and there was just all these errors that were actually not making people better and they weren't doing as good a job as they would like to have been doing as a hospital. And what they what they found is, is that a lot of these doctors were sending people to places they didn't need to go or they were sending them to the wrong wrong department they would send them to the ICU when they didn't need it or they'd send them to the regular ward when they actually should have been in the ICU and where did this come from what we were talking about earlier overconfidence and lots of information and it boiled down to they ended up providing laminated cards with various probabilities marked against the various specific diagnostic factors. So if they're looking at a patient, they could very, very quickly follow those tables and then multiply the probabilities according to the symptoms and the test findings in order to estimate the overall likelihood that this person had a problem. Basically, it was a checklist. And it cut to the, straight to the chase of here's the five things that actually matter. And here's the probability of how big a deal that is. And here's when you and if it all adds up to X, then you need to send them to the ICU. Otherwise, probably send them over here instead. And it streamlined the process. It made their diagnosis more effective. The patients were better off. And it was a simple little And beforehand, they system. were getting an additional like 10 pieces of information from the standard questions they asked. So this really streamlined it. They were getting false like net, false positive readings because someone would say, oh, you know, I have a family history of heart attacks or I have a family history. A lot of it was family history, <laughs> family history of high blood pressure. And that was making their, they were getting this positive information that would say this person's unhealthy, but it didn't have the diagnosis. Right. It, the, there were, it increased the probability that someday they might, but it didn't have to do with the situation at hand. Right. It yeah. was like, it, it's, Oh, you're from Chicago. It must be cold up there. Not today. Not today. So it, it, what it he's saying here be. is it's, when, it, when it comes to investing, it's the same thing. People are attracted to information. You turn on the TV and there's information just coming at you 24-7 about 
the markets, the investments, the interest rates, the, the Fed, the government policies, the, the this, that, and the other. Whatever they can do to keep you watching the television, really, you can open up newspapers and magazines. They're all over the place telling you all about you know the top 10 things to do to, to retire early, the top 10 things to do to make sure you beat the market, the top 10, top 5, top 7, type whatever. And at the end of the day, what they're saying in the book here is it's far better to focus on what really matters than succumbing to the siren call of Wall Street's many noise peddlers. We would far, be far better off analyzing, say, the five things we really need to know about an investment rather than trying to know absolutely everything about everything concerned with the investment. You just don't need to know everything to make a solid decision. I think as a firm, we started make, making better decisions when CNBC wasn't being played in the office. You know, yeah, we turned that off. Day. What five, ten years ago, we stopped that, and you, you're you're in a position where you're planning and you're acting proactively. And the culture, you know, in our, our, our former in our former incarnation was reacting to the news, reacting to the markets. This is happening, therefore, we have to talk about it. And, and how could you make rational decisions when you're sitting at a stress level of? 10 because the you're constantly hearing somebody screaming on tv that this is the end of the world so and, it's just and it's, and it's not it's and we're seeing it now there was a uh there's a documentary called the social dilemma that came out i think it's on netflix and it's the people who built social media talking about the unintended consequences of what they've built and what they've monetized and what it's created situations where people are attracted to that information and if you're if you're in the weeds all the time, you can't step back and detach and actually have perspective. And when you have perspective and you're detached and you're not emotional, you're able to make better decisions. This happens on battlefields with military units. It happens with people watching the news and trying to figure out what's going on in the country. And it's applicable to investors as well when they're looking at what's going on with their accounts or their financial future, if you will. A lot of it may be just total noise. Chapter seven, the next he, he talks about here is he titles it, turn off that bubble vision. And I think maybe that was a way of just not spelling out the specific business channels and business programs that are out there for, for liability purposes. Basically, it's just, hey, stop, stop with the information overload. You'll be better off for it. Um, the, the lesson here is that volatility is going to happen and it's going to sometimes creates opportunity. It says here, as we discussed in the last chapter, too much information leads us to feel overconfident in the extreme, but it does little to aid us. But this isn't our only problem with information. We actually find even useless information soothing, and we process it mindlessly. He goes on, I'm skipping ahead here. Meet Mr. Market. When it comes to the vagaries of the ups and downs of financial markets, Larry Summers provides us with the outside view. He co-authored a paper in 1989 that explored the 50 largest moves in the U.S. stock market between 1947 and 1987. Summers and colleagues scoured the press to see if they could find any reason for the market moves. They concluded, quote, On most of the sizable return days, the information that the press cites as the cause of the market move is not particularly important. Press reports on adjacent days also fail to reveal anything convincing of why future profits or discount rates might have changed, end quote. To put it another way, more than half of the largest moves in the markets were totally unrelated to anything that might be classified as fundamentals. Price volatility is a fact of life in financial markets. So what can we do to protect ourselves against these noise peddlers? He says here, turning off bubble vision is a great step towards preventing yourself from being a slave to the market. It's exactly what you talked about, Tom. We turned it off and realized how irrelevant it was. And the funny thing is, it, I can turn it on now today, and they're talking in the same way about the same kinds of things that they talked about 25 years ago. It just doesn't change. It's such a short, short-term focus that it's nearly irrelevant to almost every investor out there. And another point, like in this section, you know, we just went over is somebody will say, why was the market up 400 points today? Or why today. was it down 800 points today? A really reasonable answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> there might be not, there might not be a legitimate 
fundamental reason why the market's the press up. might say it's because of something that happened last night. Yeah. Or well, it's always great when you read sometimes mm-hmm. why the press said the market went down by this or that, and you went, "No, that's not right." <laughs> that, that doesn't. Sometimes make sense. it doesn't make sense at all. But but the best somebody can do is say, "Well, the news says this," but that doesn't even that in, that in of itself doesn't even mean that it actually is the reason. There could have been automatic program trades preset to do certain things at certain prices out there that caused it to drop that day. Or people could have felt very confident that day. It was sunny out. Yeah, it could be any any number of reasons. There's there's it's, there's many reasons why the market could hop around in a day, which I found that was, I just this, <laughs> this study was great that sometimes it just it just moves. The market does what it does sometimes. There's a chapter here called "See No Evil, Hear No Evil." It's time to prove yourself wrong. The lesson in this chapter is just hey, you you need to look for evidence that'll prove you wrong. You need to find a way to play devil's advocate if you're really to, to to insulate yourself against that overconfidence thing you really ought to take the other side of the of the table and try to argue against your own strategy against your own belief system and see if it holds up he talks here about the land of the perma bear and the perma bull so permanent bear someone who always thinks you know the sky is falling the end is near repent the end is near and, and, and these 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 Analysts are, are constantly talking about things like the banking system's going to fall apart and the world's going to end next year, the year after that, the year after that, and they just say the same thing over and over and over again. And then when there's a financial crisis, the, the bubble vision people bring them out and put them on as a talking head to talk about how they predicted this financial storm, and they've really been just saying the same thing for their whole career. A perma bull is just the same. They, they're constant. They have a little bit better odds, obviously, because generally the markets go up, but a perma bull will do the same thing. Said this is the best time in history to invest. Absolutely, it's going to go up. It's going to go up. It's going to go up. And over time, it generally does. You know, historically, it's generally you know the stock market has generally gone up over 20, 30 year periods. Almost, you know, I think it's like almost one hundred percent of the thirty year periods it's gone up. But there are some flat to negative twenty year periods that are on record still, mm-hmm. and they can be just as wrong. Um, those people are basically just attention getters. They're not money makers necessarily, um, not in the long run. He talks here about the sunk cost fallacy. This is a tendency to allow past unrecoverable expenses to inform your current decisions. Brutally put, we tend to hang on to our views too long simply because we spent time and effort in coming up with those views in the first place. And we've seen this where somebody has a stock that they bought once upon a time and they transferred their account in and we said, Hey, let's sell this stock. No, I, I don't want to sell it because it's down from when I bought it. Well, we didn't recommend it, but it's down for whatever reason. And then time goes on and it, it just goes down more and more and more and more. And they just can't unload. They can't find bring it to this. It might be a minuscule piece of their portfolio, but in their mind, they can't bring themselves. It's almost painful to bring themselves to making a decision to sell something because what, what the case is made in the book is that they spent so much energy picking that stock. It's like they have pride in it. It becomes part of you almost. It's your decision. You can't let, you know, you, you become emotionally attached to it. I see that a lot. The thing to get attached to is your process that we talked about earlier. Don't be getting attached to the individual holdings. Get attached to the system. Get attached to your process for buying, your process for selling, your process for managing risk, your process for planning ahead. You know, so but this this conservatism is pervasive everywhere. And he talks about institutional managers that do the same thing. You know, they'll they'll hang on to losers and 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 they really they really need to just have a discipline there. This seems like it flies in the face of buying and holding. To a great extent, it is. It does. You know, you got you've got this, and this guy's coming from a this this. This author is a deep value investor, so he's he's of the mindset it's not a buy. He's not a buy and hold, buy the market and hold it forever kind of guy. He's hey, buy something that's undervalued, and get rid of it when it's overvalued, and that's how you're gonna you know generate better results over time. And that's I think the the filter that he's coming from. And so you have to recognize that filter that here he's you're talking reading about this. Like individual stocks, not portfolios. Yeah, because your overall you might you might have a, a a fund that does that, that that buys low and sells high, a value fund, but maybe 
you shouldn't be buying and selling that value fund. Maybe your process is if you're a, a, a typical investor investing in index funds, maybe your process is a much simpler thing where you're just, I'm going to buy and I'm going to, I'm going to hold. But yeah, a lot of this book is talking about individual stock picks and, and things like that. So it may not be totally relevant, but nonetheless, I've seen it happen. I've seen people where they just can't get rid of something that's just garbage or yeah, it's no longer appropriate. They'll have a whole entire portfolio that's all even like ETFs and they'll have one stock position that they cannot sell buy more of talk about without getting upset and they need to talk about it every time it's it's the focus of everything they're doing and it's 0.44 percent of their overall net worth and we've had that happen where somebody was focused on a position that was a few hundred dollars at this point of some stock that it's not going to affect their life one way or the other if they sell it but we'd, we'd find a client who wanted to spend 45 minutes with their financial advisor discussing that one position and they're ignoring their overall retirement plan. They're ignoring their overall strategy because they're just fixated on this one minuscule thing. We saw those, the people I mentioned from the dot com era, we had an airline pilot who was emotionally attached to United Airlines stock. It's a tragic story because almost all his net worth was in this. He had seven figures in this, in this one stock. And he couldn't bring himself to sell and diversify because it was an expression of who he was. It's like he he worked his whole career for this, and if I sell it, I'm I'm I'm. He felt like he was betraying the employer that gave him this great career, and he it, he just couldn't bring himself to diversify. Um, another example is the, the the client that had a dot com bubble era stock, and he was a millionaire. He went from thousand era to millionaire to thousand era all inside of an eighteen month period. Multi millionaire. But he never captured the multi-million part because he just couldn't bring himself to diversify, even though any outsider would go, oh, my gosh, you just made a couple million bucks in a short period of time. That's a rare event. That's unlikely to sustain itself forever. You know, why would why wouldn't you like lock in at least a part of that? Nope. The whole thing. I wrote it all the way down. So what can we do to guard against conservatism as this guy, as, as, as the book asks? Rather than hanging on to our views, what we should do is give ourselves a blank sheet of paper and imagine our positions were zero and ask ourselves, given what we know now, should we, would we invest in what, we're, what we were before? And I've played this game with people just trying to break through this inertia where people are sitting still and they can't unlock it. I said, hey, if, if you walked in with a cash ch- or a check to deposit in your account for the entire value of what you have with us, and that's all you had in the world, a brand spanking new account with whatever, half a million dollars in cash sitting in your in your new account. Would you still buy that thing? And a lot of times they'll say, well, no, of course I wouldn't buy any more today. Then, then why own it now? It's just a good exercise to play with yourself to kind of get a fresh start. Another approach that they talk about to defeating conservatism is to play the game of devil's advocate with other people who are educated and they can you can just go against each other. A lot of teams will do this at professional firms where they'll say they'll, they'll, they'll have a, a meeting where you say, here's my idea and why, and everybody will take the other side of that and test it. Make sure it holds water. But hanging on to a view simply because it is your view is likely to end in tears. As Keynes said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Chapter 10 is the siren song of stories. It's a lesson in focusing on the facts. Of all the dangers that investors face, perhaps none is more seductive than the siren song of stories. Stories essentially govern the way we think. We will abandon evidence in favor of a good story. It severely distorts our mental representation of the world. This is true. We talked about this outside of this book recently, I believe. Every once in a while, something comes along where it There's a great story in the dot com bubble era in the late 90s. The story was there's a revolutionary technology, it's going to change the world, and you can't even imagine how amazing it's going to be. And everybody kind of knew that was true, but nobody really knew how specifically it was going to be enacted. And we we covered the book, the dot, the uh, uh, dot con a few episodes back talking about that era, but they, people were making mistakes. They got hung up in the story. And at a certain point you get so hung up on the story of it's the future. And anybody that 
that says, hey, uh, maybe that's a little overvalued or maybe it's insane to go along with that story. Yeah, it might be true, but do you really want to pay that much for that thing? And people will beat you down over that and say, you've got, you don't understand. It's the future. I'll buy the future at any price. And the truth is, it's just not, it's not probable. You've got to be careful of getting hung up in a story uh, along the line. Those lines are initial public offerings. They always have a great story because there's no history. There's no history. There's no math. There's no history of earnings. There's no history of dividends. So you, all you have to work with, with an initial public offering in many cases is a story. So people get very excited about initial public offerings. How can I get that new thing that's finally available? And the research shows that the average under average IPO, according to the book here, in the United States, anyway, the average IPO has underperformed the market by 21% per year in the last three years after its listing, covering the period 1980 to 2007. Similar patterns can be found in most countries. When they look at those individual uh, initial private offering stocks, the average, we were talking earlier about, hey, what does the price imply for future growth? The research on IPO said that the average price implied 33% yearly growth. But what do these stocks actually manage to deliver? Nothing short of a disaster. The average delivered free cash flow growth was minus 55% over five years. Talk about overpaying for the hope of growth. And you had some things to say about IPOs that I thought were kind of interesting. Yeah, that there's there's really three reasons to, to do an IPO. One is you own the company and you want to get your money out. Number two is... You can't get lending from private banks or private uh, private equity anymore. And the last one is you need to get better managers. So those aren't great. And you want to use you want to use publicly traded stock as some sort of an incentive program to attract talent. Yeah, they're, 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 those are the really the three reasons to IPO. And you think about the number of companies that go IPO versus the number of companies that stay public. Stay private, yeah. And, you know, or, or rather, the, you know, 80% of our economy, I think, last time I looked, is the vast majority of our, of our economy, at least in the United States, is privately held businesses. Yeah. There's and there's a vast amount of wealth in privately held companies. And those are the ones, in many cases, are highly profitable. They, Because you know, when you go public, you have all these, uh, it's kind of like golden handcuffs. You get a lot of cash up front because you've sold your stock to the general, to the various investors that are buying the stock that first time. And the company receives that money that day or the, and then the owners who sold that their portion of the stock or whatever, get, got their cash. Like you said, the owners want it out, but that's the only real time that that company receives the cash because of their stock. It's like a big infusion of cash. And now what do they have? Well, now they have a bunch of new partners and those new partners have to be told every quarter Here's what our estimates are. Here's what the earnings estimates are. And they all want to vote and they all have questions. And you've traded that big pile of cash for a huge responsibility to those investors. And it creates complexity. It costs money. It actually may create opportunity for you to go global or whatever. And there's a few companies that have done that very, very well. Obviously, there's some phenomenally profitable companies that are public. But if you're trying to focus in on those IPOs about those stories, they got a cool story. This is this has got a thing. It's not approved yet by the FDA, but it's going to magically cure blah blah blah. And I'm gonna I want to get in on the front end of this thing. And the truth is, in all probability, you probably don't. Rob Arnott and his colleagues have found that investors almost always overpay for the hope of growth. So if you have a great story about this phenomenal growth thing that's gonna happen, that's on the come, it hasn't happened yet. They haven't made a profit yet. But it, it, it's the future. Anytime you hear that, odds are somebody's overpaying. We were talking in, your, in the office the other day about storytelling a little bit different than just the IPOs or stocks was with the man, when you had eyes closed and one was being showed a shovel, I was a shovel, and another eye was, show, was shown, what was it, uh, snow, snow and uh, uh, hay? What was this from? Um from a podcast it, it i was listening to some podcast episode and they were talking about how you years ago they used to separate the right and the left brain from each other to like treat epilepsy and things like that and, and it would cure that there's this this bundle of nerves that was between the two hemispheres of the brain and if you cut those 
the, the right side of the brain would receive all the input from, say, your left eye. They kind of cross over. So your left eye seeing an image of uh, a chicken coop. And your right eye is seeing an image of a snowy driveway. Then they would put, and, and it was a little complicated, but your, and it was a little bit more involved than maybe we can get into now. But the bottom line is that your ability to point and see something happened on one side of your brain. Your ability to talk about something came from the other side of your brain. So they'd literally show a picture of a shovel. And if, if the eye was looking at the chicken coop, they'd show a picture of the shovel. And then they... they, or they, they would conv- You would be convinced you're, the side that would be pointing would be pointing towards the snow because you were going to shovel the snow. So what they did is they took these two pictures, a chicken coop and a snowy driveway, and they showed a picture of a shovel. And when the person was asked to point at the thing most appropriate for the shovel, they would point at the snowy driveway. But when asked to explain why they made that choice, the speech centers of the brain happened on the chicken coop side of the brain. And the speech that came out, they just pointed it. They just visually pointed at the driveway, the snowy driveway. The shovel is to clear the snow. But when they had to explain, they'd say, oh, well, it's because chicken coops get a lot of chicken poop and you need to shovel the poop out. And they spoke with such authority over that, but they had no, because the speech side of the brain had no perception of the snowy driveway that was a far more appropriate use for the shovel. And the the story behind that was we have this capability to fill in the gaps whenever there's a great story out there. And to convince ourselves of just about everything. And again, you need to step back and look around before you make a call. Because otherwise, you're going to fall right into a trap. Use that Spock part of your brain to say, Juan, is the, am I just telling myself a story? When So we were talking the other day about clients looking at past performance. And saying, I was saying that that is telling a story. Yeah, it's another angle on the whole story. So idea. those are just random points in time, but in the client's brain or anyone's brain, you're turning it into a story and saying they did this, then this, then this, then this, and then they will do this. They create a narrative, a story, just from what any scientist or would say are just random points in time and in ran, you know random points in time and concrete data. You've created a story. And we'll see actually this exact thing happen in graphs that research firms will put together sometimes where you'll see a plot of different points over a period of time and you have all the information that's known and has been reported so far. And then what they'll do is they'll have their prediction for the future. And it's amazing how crazy and bumpy and random the actual information was leading up to this point. But everybody who makes any kind of a forecast, it's always like a straight line up, down or sideways. And, and what, what, what the book even talks about this, it says they call it straight line extrapolation. You're basically continuing the curve. Oh, it's been going up. I'm just going to keep going up. Oh, it's been going down. It's going to keep going down. And whenever you see that straight line extrapolation of growth forecast, it's a classic sign of trouble in real time. So again, what can we do to guard against the siren song of stories? The answer is relatively simple. You must focus on the facts. And again, they, they, they kind of gloss over this. Focus on the facts sounds pretty simple. But it's very I can see it very easily for somebody to say, well, the fact is it did 10%, and then it did 11%, and then it did 12 and then it did 13 or, and then it did 14 and then it did 15 The fact is it's going to do 16 and 17 and 18 from there. It's a fact. And they're focusing on the wrong facts. That There's nothing predictive in past performance. We've said it a million times. I think I'm going to be saying it to my grave because people simply want to want to believe it. They want to believe that story that something that has been going up is going to keep going up and something that's been going down is going to keep going down. And this is why the average investor does so poorly relative to the overall markets. It's such an easy story to tell yourself because it makes sense in the natural world. Plus it's based on information that's very available. 
past returns are readily available. And you feel really comfortable by getting more of it. Yeah, look, I, I've looked at it every, I've looked at like the whole last 10 years. I mean, for goodness sake, 10 years is a long time, especially if you're 23 years old. It's a long time. Somebody that's 70, they're going to tell you 10 years isn't that long. But, you know, people will stop looking in, or they'll look at a period of, uh, I'll see graphs all the time that are published. And they're like, look, there's a pattern. And they're looking at a three-year chart. The world hasn't really changed that much in a three-year period. A, a typical economic cycle can be anywhere from 7 to 12 to 15 years, depending on the era. And it's just not long enough. You need to look at multiple cycles. And, and then you run into another thing where you have people say, well, yeah, but that was a long, long time ago. This is like the, day, the age of the Internet. They didn't have the Internet back in 1929. No, that they had is they had radio. And radio actually did change the world similarly to the way cars change the world or airplanes or jet travel and all and other things other technology has always been there it's just that we don't see it as technology because it's not information technology but there've been bubbles before and there've been innovations have always been around and they did change the world and everybody had stories about those innovations and they've created bubbles out of those and those bubbles popped there's always going to be innovation bubbles and and people get it's just easy for them to get hung up on on chasing things. Here's a chapter called "This Time It's Is Different," and he's talking about how you can gain an advantage over the pros. And and specifically, there's a theory out there that every overvalued market, every collapse, every bear market is like a total and complete surprise that was completely random, and no one could possibly have seen that there were that the conditions were ripe for something bad to happen. Black Swan. Call it a, they'll call it a black swan. And in fact, Tassim Nailed. Nassim Taleb. Taleb. Is, he authored a book called The Black Swan. It's a fascinating book, and he is actually a, a, a brilliant. But it, it would be, and he would probably agree with this, is that there are some things that the extent of it might be so unexpected that someone might think there's no way anyone could have possibly known. And he was taught, he wrote his book right after the 2008 crisis and, and, uh, and did quite well. But then you have people who actually did their homework, like the doctor who was highlighted in the movie and the book, the, the big short, he actually found out he knew all those mortgages were garbage. He knew it was a house of cards and he bet big against it and turned out to be a very, very profitable trade. Cost him a lot in the short run in doing that. But the, the case that's being made in this book is that there are surprises out there that are predictable. and But in a lot of cases, we fail to see the predictable, quote, surprises because of psychological hurt, hurdles that get in our way. And there's our old friend over-optimism. That's one. I just believe it's going to keep doing well because it's been doing so well. I mean, it's gonna be, look, it's doing so well. Of course it's going to do well. I mean, everybody knows. There's the illusion of control, and the penultimate hurdle is myopia. We haven't talked about this yet, but it's that overt focus on the short term. And he also talks about, and we're going to talk more about the short term, but the final barrier to spotting predictable surprises is a form of inattentional blindness. So put bluntly, we simply don't expect to see what we're not looking for. We've heard this before, you know, you only, you can find whatever you're looking for. You know, Google is a great form format for that. I'm going to Google something and, oh, look, I found evidence of the thing. I already, my own preconceived notion because I Google searched it. I was searching for the thing and, oh, look, I found the thing. It's not like you randomly ran across it. It's you were actively searching for something and Google provided it to you. And then you snap to believe, oh, that's because that's the common thing. No, it's because you actually search for that specific thing. This is the flip of that. You don't expect to see what you're not looking for. And they offer a beginner's guide to spotting bubbles. Some words of wisdom to begin that off is, if something can't go on forever, it won't. This is a deceptively simple and yet immensely insightful phrase. If markets seem too good to be true, they probably are. I'd say, likewise, if things seem to be too bad to be true, they probably aren't that bad. But what can we do? A good working knowledge of the history of bubbles can also help preserve your capital. Although the details of bubbles change, the underlying patterns and dynamics are eerily similar. 
So this goes back to the, the, the this framework that the author used goes back to a paper uh, written in 1867 by a man named John Stuart Mill, who will be mentioned in here. But he talks about five phases of a bubble. The first one is called displacement. It's the birth of a boom. And it's like a shock that triggers the creation of proper opportunities. It's kind of like announcing the in the dot-com book, they talked about when the internet finally became a commercial enterprise. That was That was the spark. That was the displacement. Followed by credit creation, where now all these profit-making capabilities, now banks are starting to say, hey, we're going to fund that because you know what? It's got a great story. It's the future. And then you get to euphoria. Everyone starts to buy into the new era. And I'd consider that like the late 90s where everything's just starting to really turn vertical. Get a lot frothy. Of, Real heated. Very heated, very frothy, very spirited. Sir John Templeton's four most dangerous words in investing. This time is different. And the critical stage is financial distress. So this is where insiders are cashing out. It's rapidly followed by financial distress, which the excess in which the excess leverage that's been built up during the boom becomes a major problem. Fraud also emerges during the stages of the bubble's life. When we covered the 1929 crash, one of the things that they talked about in, in, in that book was that when a bubble pops and things get disastrous, that's when all the fraudsters start getting caught. That's when all the Ponzi schemes fall apart. We saw that happen in 2008 with um, Madoff. Madoff because no one, he had not actually gotten caught by the authorities. He turned himself in because the whole thing fell apart and he was, he was actually afraid for his life from criminal or reprisals because he was actually probably managing some money for people that were not so nice. Maybe they weren't so nice, especially if you lost billions of their dollars. But when you start seeing those kinds of things, and you, you can read more in the book here, there are phases of bubbles. And if you can look at what's going on out there and then compare them to these phases, you can kind of get a sense of, A, if you're in a bubble, and B, where in that bubble might you be. The final stage is revulsion. And that's where people are so scarred that they can't, they just bail out on the whole market. And that's what we saw in 2008. The conservative person that says, I'm tired of watching the news, get me out, I'm out. Like you're down 5%, the rest of the world's down 50. I don't care, I'm out, the world's coming to an end, get me out, I want to go to the bank. Bottom line is they, they didn't have a framework for processing something that big. And it was a pretty odd thing that happened back in, to, to say the least, in 2008. Mill opined, as a rule, I thought this was great, panics do not destroy capital. They merely reveal the extent to which it has previously been destroyed by its betrayal into hopelessly unproductive works. The failure of great banks, the mercantile firms, those are all symptoms incident to the disease. They're not the disease itself. And I tell you, you can go back and look at any bubble, and that's exactly what happened. People put a bunch of junk, a bunch of money into a bunch of junk. But nobody knew it was junk because it kept going up. And the panic happened. It just reveals what the, you know. Warren Buffett says, when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. Pretty much every bubble in history can be mapped against this framework. It should help to guide us in our thinking and, and analysis when it comes to avoiding bubbles. And he gives a little piece in here where he says, your edge over the pros, your edge over the professionals. A big edge is you don't have to be a slave to an arbitrary benchmark. So many fund managers, they're, they're stuck where they have to compare themselves to a specific index, whether that's you know the S&P 500 or some other index, but they're stuck because they're always compared to that one thing. And it's arbitrary. Does it have anything to do with your personal financial goals? We have a client that, that constantly, you know, the last few times we met with him, he's, he's getting up there in years, but he, the last few times we've, we've talked with him, he said, hey, what can I watch on TV that's announced that has anything to do with what I've invested in. And he's actually mostly not in stocks. He's very, very, very conservative because he's older, more stable guy. And the, the sad answer is there's nothing on TV that has anything to do with you. It was very frustrating because he wants to be able to say, Oh, there's news and that affects me. And it, it just doesn't, he, he's not tied. He's tied to his own financial goals. His portfolio is aligned with him and his goals. 
And that's the advantage you have over a pro. You don't have to focus on following some index. You might be invested partially in that index, but your whole overall goal should not be, I have to follow that index. The goal should be, I have reasons I'm investing. I have objectives and I want to meet those objectives. And I also have a risk tolerance that I want to follow. I want to get there as smoothly as possible or with the highest probability of success or whatever your goals are. But that's the big one. You don't have to be a slave to that. He also says, hey, if you're going to if you're going to try to stand against a bubble, if you're in a bubble and you don't you want to go against the crowd, you better not be using leverage. The market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. So be careful. A few other good quotes here. Just on this, this idea of not just going along with with bubbles and whatnot. People are trying to do the right thing. Uh, Marie Eveliard of First Eagle said, I would rather lose half my clients than half my client's money. Investors should remember bubbles are a byproduct of human behavior, and human behavior is all too predictable. Eveliard further observed, sometimes what matters is not so much how low the odds are that circumstances could turn negative. What matters more is what the consequences would be if that happens. In other words, sometimes the potentially long-term negative outcomes are so severe that investors can't afford to ignore them, even in the short term. What are they talking about here? Insurance. Your house is very unlikely to burn down, but if it does, you're in a lot of trouble. And so we buy insurance for that. The we talked about this in in other chapters. There's there's or other episodes. There are there are events that are highly probable, and then there's events that are improbable, but high impact. And those are the ones we buy insurance for a tornado, a flood, if, like you said, a fire, you know, is going to take your house. Um, when you're talking about it, you're investing, managing risk is not about the idea that well, what she's saying is it's not about the idea that it's highly probable that we're going to have a bear market tomorrow. It's that it's going to happen sometime while you're investing and you want to make sure you're prepared for it. It's this game plan that we've all been talking about throughout this entire book. You've got to have a game plan for what if you're in a bubble? What if the bubble pops? What if there's a catastrophic event? What if there's what if something good happens? What if something bad happens? You need to have that game plan and you need to have all these moves on the chessboard pre-planned because in the moment you're going to make a mistake. Chapter 12 talks about writing away your mistakes and biases by looking at things this way. You can be right for the wrong reason or you can be wrong for the right reason. What I've seen is I've seen people who um, there's a bad outcome and then they're a Monday morning quarterback. I knew it. I should have. I knew it all the time. I should have done it this way or that way. I would have, should have, could have done it differently because I knew it. And the truth is they still made the decision to do what they did. And if they really knew it, they didn't. So what's the cure for that is this whole idea of self-attribution that said, oh, I, 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 I knew what was going to happen and I, I just didn't follow through on my system or whatever it was. The fact is they didn't have a system. And if you want to be really honest with yourself, you should keep a written record of the decisions you make. And not only the decisions you make, but the reasons you made those decisions. Keep a diary of that. And if you have an investment diary, you're less likely to attribute bad outcomes or good outcomes for the wrong reasons. So if you look at this, you've got a matrix. You could have good outcomes. You could have bad outcomes. And those could have come from right reasoning or wrong reasoning. So you could have a good outcome that came from a good reasoning. And that's probably, that could be skill maybe, but you could also have a good outcome come just from good luck. You had a bad process and you had good luck. Likewise, you need to know, Hey, did I follow right reasoning? And I still had a bad outcome. Well, you know what? Stuff happens. Bad luck. Bad luck. Or did I follow, get a bad outcome because I had wrong reasoning? You need to think these things through. And by keeping a diary, you're less likely to make those, have that hindsight bias. And this, this idea that, oh, I knew the outcome. I knew it all the time. You know, I've never seen somebody say that that actually knew that. Because if you really did know that, you probably wouldn't have made the decision. Mm-hmm. It's just a way of trying to like justify your ego. But if you want to be honest with yourself, you want to feel good or you want to actually be successful. Brian, that's probably another thing to do with storytelling. They've created a narrative. I've created a story (laughs) to serve my ego. Um, 
you know, it can be, a, it, it can just be a real benefit to investors because it, it helps you hold you true to your, your thoughts at the actual point in time rather than, and this is from the book, rather than our reassessed version of the offense of the events after we know the outcome. It's simple. It's very effective. What's one of our guidelines? Simple and effective. It's a simple and effective method of learning from your mistakes and should be a central part of your approach to investment. Talk a little bit more about the short term. This tendency to think short term isn't unique to bubbles. We see it all the time. Investors today appear to have a chronic attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, when it comes to their portfolio. He's talking right here about people feeling they need to do something and make changes constantly. So the average holding period in 2000 this is when the book came out in 2010 was around six months. I think it's shorter now in 2020. I would imagine it would be. But years ago, you know, decades ago, people would hold stocks for seven or eight years. And uh, the focus on the short term, it's really hard to reconcile short term holdings with any view of the fundamentals that are out there. You know, not only do we desire quick results, but we love to be seen as doing something is what he says in here. So as opposed to doing nothing, there's this distinct bias toward action. He talks about an example of a soccer goalie. A soccer goalkeeper, you know, football for those of you in Europe, it there's a there's a thing in the soccer games called a penalty kick, and it's the ball's out there in, in the center, and some they're going to kick it. It's either going to go to the right or the left or the center, and most goalkeepers will jump either right or left when statistically speaking they'd be better off standing right in the middle. Statistically, they'd have a better chance, and it's no different with investors. There's this this idea that you have to act and react to noise and to events that occur. And what seems to happen here is that there's this bias to action is especially intense after a loss. If you have a period of poor performance in your in portfolio terms, psychologists have asked people to consider when they have a, a, a decline in value, do they feel like they need to change or do they going to keep doing what they've been doing? And Invariably, they all want to make a change when things go down, and it's not necessarily the be best thing. What you want to do is use patience as a weapon, and you can protect that yourself by working on your patience and taking your time. Take a step back, follow your system. Um, but unfortunately, what happens is is that in the short term, that can actually harm you a little bit because you, you might feel wrong in the short run. Red Sox legend Ted Williams was an example in his book, he, Williams describes part of the secret to his phenomenal 344 career batting average. And this is, this goes to the patience thing. He wouldn't swing at everything. He actually had divided the strike zone into specific areas. He had 77 different areas of the strike zone and he would only swing if it was in certain areas of the strike zone. And he, he figured out that's where the, that's where his odds were greatest. <laughs> of having a base hit. And he just looked at it from a, from a scientific standard. He said, okay, the, the odds are with me if I swing here. Well, what do we do as investors? Well, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to keep everything fully invested. You'll hear people say, I want to make sure all my money's working all the time. Now, keep in mind, this is coming from the perspective of a deep value investor, this author. So he's, he's the ultimate patient person waiting for the fat pitch. But he says, holding cash is uncomfortable, but not as uncomfortable as doing something stupid, like buying that shiny story stock that's overvalued. Seth Klarman picks up on the baseball metaphor in his brilliant book, Margin of Safety, and writes, most institutional investors feel compelled to be fully invested at all times. They act as if an umpire were calling balls and strikes, mostly strikes, thereby forcing them to swing at almost every pitch and forego batting selectivity for frequency. So they're swinging all the time because they feel like they need to swing all the time. I want my money working for me all the time. When the truth is sometimes you might be better off being more selective and then being more effective with how that money's working for you. And part of the problem for investors is they expect investing to be exciting, largely thanks to the bubble vision. Paul Samuelson once opined, investing should be dull. It shouldn't be exciting. Investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Vegas. Blaise Pascal put it best when he said, quote, 
all men's miseries derive from not being able to sit in a quiet room alone, unquote. Alternatively, as Winnie the Pooh pointed out, quote, never underestimate the value of doing nothing, end quote. I'm not sure how to quite react to that one. Because there's, there's, there's a case to be made that you, you want to stack the odds in your favor. And we're looking at things from a different perspective because we're building overall portfolios across multiple categories. We're not really stock pickers. I can understand it if you're a stock picker and you only have the option of either buying a stock or having cash. And those are your only options. You might want to be very selective about what you buy and when you buy it. But there's also a lot of math that says, hey, just buy the market and the odds are in your favor as long as you're patient enough. Yeah, when I'm reading this, I think the same thing going to my mind. Well, I like to do nothing by just holding, owning, owning the whole market. That's and, how I like to do nothing. And I think the caveat is is that hey, if you're if you don't care about the volatility in the short run, if you can truly stand that level of volatility that goes along with owning the whole market, and you can be truly patient enough to let the averages work in your favor, meaning. 20 plus years in most cases, then absolutely that's an effective way to do it, do things is to do it that way. And that's where I think is, is very effective. The challenge is that the, maybe the, what he's talking about here is that there's some folks out there that are trying to manage risk in different ways than when in the way we do. They're looking at a an investment world where there's individual stocks and there's cash and there's nothing else. And in that world, if you're trying to manage risk, yeah, absolutely. You, you have, you have, or if you're trying to be a little shorter term than 20 more years, then you, you're trying to maximize your returns. Obviously you're going to try to buy something that's really on sale. Or you're going to try to be patient and wait for the odds to be in your favor. You don't want to buy something necessarily. Well, for example, like Apple, Apple had a, a price earnings ratio like of around 10, not very long ago. And 10 a better price probably better price to buy better value to buy that stock than if it was like a uh, uh, thousand and ten you know it's the obviously overweight type situation you'd probably say oh, the, I'm not sure I want to buy that thing that's a thousand times its earnings that's implying a 50 percent growth rate for the next 50 years straight uh, probably 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 something worth the maybe to wait for a better price and better entry point on that individual stock it's not something we wrestle with on a regular basis but I can see a lot of people getting wrapped up in this yeah and the book isn't about financial planning correct it is about stocks it's it's about your psychological errors when you're looking at basically individual stock performance but we see some similarities and that's why we're covering the book yeah where people are doing this but just if you're reading the book and you're not really into individual stocks by no means are we recommending people should be picking individual stocks but it's just the how the psychology works to the to that point, I mean, he's he's a value investor, so everything's about being a contrarian. So he talks a little bit about this. If you go against the crowd, it it's not comfortable. He says nonconformity triggered fear in people. They said they they had had again a lot of the a lot of the chapters of the book. They dive into psychological uh, experiments that were done in, in academia. Nonconformity triggered fear in people. Going against the crowd makes people scared. It goes even further. Not only does going against the herd trigger fear, but it can cause pain as well. Fortunately, although painful, a strategy, this is now back to the investing world, a strategy of being a contrarian is integral to successful investment. And we just took a different stance on that a moment ago. If you're patient enough, you can have a good outcome. I think what this person's thesis would be is that, yeah, but if you bought it even cheaper, you'd have an even better outcome. And that's what he's trying, a value investor is going to say that. As Sir John Templeton put it, it is impossible to pr produce superior performance unless you do something that is different from the majority. That I will agree with. I will disagree with that. It's impossible to have an extraordinary, I guess, I guess the way I look at it is I look at it and say, you can't be different without being different. Well, here's my, or, my comeback to it is if you just did what everybody said they did would do is just buy and hold. He'll get that that return the same as the market, which will beat the average which, of which what people the average actually person. get, which is like 2%. 
your your point's well taken because there's so many people out there that think the baseline is the market return. And as Dalbar shows year after year after year, the baseline is way, way less than the market return because the average investor doesn't do it. Why don't they do as well as the market? Because of all these psychological errors that we make as human beings. We buy high, we sell low, we're overconfident. We listen to experts that we shouldn't listen to. All those things, we have a short-term focus in myopia, all those things work against us to f- keep us from getting that market return. And, you know, it, if you're going to be, but again, if you were doing what those other people did. Yes. yes. If I you want to do something significantly better than what everybody else is doing, you're going to have to do something different than what everybody else is doing. And what's everybody else doing? Guess what they're not doing? Most people are not just buying the market and holding it. Most people are doing insane stuff because of our psychological errors that are the topic of this book and they're getting substandard results and if they simply solve those problems they could approach market returns and maybe do better and i will say sticking with that sticking with buying your portfolio of stocks and bonds and sticking with it using index can be very difficult if they're right here where they're talking about is going against the herd is when your friends are talking about oh i have this stock this stock, this stock, and this stock, and they just did this, this, and this. Oh, man. And oh, it's doing so well in the last three weeks. Holy cow. It's like Vegas. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I've been in – I see this on Facebook in these groups, and you've seen it too, honestly, because you're in there a little bit. But it's <laughs> it's weird when you've been – you know, I've reached a point now where I've been doing – I've been a, a professional advisor since late 1994. When I see a comment from somebody that's extremely confident – because they've got a lot of information at their disposal. They started investing on March 24th, which, by the way, was right around the bottom of the market this year. March 24, 2020, look it up. It's, it's a it's pretty, pretty good bargain opportunity. And they bought uh, some very, very aggressive stocks at the very, very right time. And you see a lot this a lot and say, oh, my gosh, I've, I'm up 75% since, you know, in the last three or four or six months or whatever. And they're telling their parents, this and and we we talk with the parents and grandparents and we mention these these stories and they'll say you know what my kid my grandkid he's been just doing amazing in the last six months and it got me kind of thinking maybe we ought to start you know talking about xyz stock instead and i'm like oh gosh here we go you know this it is very difficult to avoid that temptation and you just get caught up in the hype and caught up in the short term caught up in the story and not focused on the math at all and the, the growth rates that are implied by some of these these things that are going, quote, to the moon. You know, it's it's phenomenal. I've, I've seen people who are all excited about a com- There's a, there's a, com- well, I'll just say it. You take Tesla Motors, for example. The CEO of Tesla Motors is named Elon Musk. Elon Musk, now Tesla Motors is a publicly traded stock. They make electric cars, they make batteries, they're going to make uh, solar-powered roofs that feed into electrical battery systems for your house. All these things happen under the Tesla brand name. Now, Elon Musk is also a leader in another company that's privately held. This other company is called SpaceX, and they're revolutionizing space travel back, you know, happening from the United States uh, waters and United States soil. There is a tremendous amount of excitement in the story around setting Tesla aside. The SpaceX story has a tremendous amount of traction right now in 2020. And there's talk of all kinds of revolutionary technologies that come come from SpaceX. Here's where things get a little, I'll call it bubblicious. There are an awful lot of people that believe that SpaceX is part of Tesla. I've heard this. And that if you buy Tesla stock, you will benefit from SpaceX's profits. They are separate companies. They have the same CEO, but they are separate companies. And the money does not flow from SpaceX to Tesla, as far as I know. One company's privately held, the other's publicly held. They're different companies. And he owns fiduciary duties differently to two different corporations. The CEO, yeah. That is a whole other story. But it's this idea that people can get caught up in 
in the hype, in the story, and all these things. There's there's even research to show that institutional money managers fall to, fall to the same thing. There's a thing called groupthink. And this is when it gets really challenging for the rational among us to deal with people who are falling into this area of groupthink. It's really hard to stay fixed on the facts and stay fixed on the fundamentals that have been proven to work over time when there's a situation of groupthink. And so he talks a little about how do you recognize if there's groupthink out there? Tell me if you, this, any of this sounds familiar to you. Number one, there's eight symptoms, by the way. So if you got your pencil and paper, get them out. Groupthink. Number one, there's an illusion of invulnerability. So this goes to that high levels of optimism. And encourage, you know, your, people are encouraged to take extreme risks. Overconfidence, overoptimism. Number two, collective rationalization. If you bring up an idea, hey, this might be maybe a red flag, they'll rationalize why that's not a factor. Number three, a belief in inherent morality. This is the future that's good for the world. We, we're, we're, this is part of groupthink. This is the right thing to do. We're on the right side of history, we're, whatever it may be. And it, when it's investing, it, you see the similar kinds of things that can occur. That there's some scene somewhat, uh, there can be just some inherent morality in what they're doing. And even if it's not true, they'll rationalize a way to make it so. Number four, stereotyped views of outgroups. So if you're not part of the, the group think, if you say anything counter to the group think, you get, they stereotype you. And what I see happening with the small investors and the new investors, it's every, everybody's either the new investor that get it, that understand that day trading these individual story stocks is the future and buy and hold and the other, the other group that's out there, the only other group that's out there, they call there are boomers. Oh, you're such an old man. You're such a boomer. That's antiquated. That's this. It's this time is different. And instantly, me who's like born straight smack in the middle of Gen X is now a boomer. You know, I'm I'm equated to somebody in their 70s that doesn't understand. You know, you don't understand, old man. This is about the. I've had this some happen. You don't understand, old man. This is about the internet, and the internet's changing the world. And I'm like, you know, I was 26 years old when the internet, or 25 years old when the internet came out. I actually was in college when they invented Ethernet and email and stuff like that. Stereotyping. Number five, direct pressure on dissenters. So you get people that are, I see this with investors where um, they're, they're under pressure to not express any arguments against the group. And any open discussion. So that's group think. Number six is self-censorship. So you start to doubt yourself, so you don't even speak up anymore. Um, number seven, there's an illusion of unanimity. Everybody thinks this. Everybody knows this. And the last one being uh, mind guards are appointed. So you've got people out there that are designed to kind of keep the group think going. And this has happened in the investment world. And it's and we saw, I saw it with the dot-con era. We saw it in the 60s with the Nifty 50. We've seen it to a great extent, some level of groupthink on the whole. Even the idea of um, index funds are the only way to go. That's become pervasive. And you just got to be on guard. Is that groupthink? You know, maybe, maybe. I mean, I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it is groupthink. But we should all be aware and open to the idea that at any moment in time, we might fall susceptible to groupthink. We need to be strong enough to step back and look around and go, wait a second, with perspective, a different perspective, is there a chance we're making an error here? Mm -hmm. Agreed. It's really hard to do. Um, Especially but, when you're in the midst of it, you might not know. It's, it's really hard to do. But just a little discipline of saying, hey, I'm going to step back and look around with a different perspective. Maybe I can make a better call than somebody else who's down in the weeds, stuck in that groupthink, or even stuck in something that might someday become groupthink or something. You just have to be aware of it. And then he talks about this idea that it, it's like a demon. It's conformity. You know, we, we, all, we all love to see the, rebel, the rebels. You watch Star Wars and you love to see the, 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 the rebellion. You want to be the underdog type of thing. And yet we all naturally conform to the part, to the point where some of the times we become quote, the empire and now it's that. So if you want to overcome that, then you gotta be, have the courage to be different. 
you got to be a critical thinker and you got to have some grit and perseverance in order to stick to your principles. This all goes back to, you need to have, you need to have some discipline. You need to have some sort of a process in place that you've already, that you're, you're adhering to. Otherwise you're just a leaf in the wind being blown around you know, by everybody else. A logic lead based system. <laughs> Amen. It cannot be a system based on your emotions because that would defeat as well. So it has to be systematic, logically designed system. This uh, this chapter here is called "You Got to Know When to Fold Them." It's a question I actually get pretty pretty often: is um, when is it time? And this is more on the internet from the the beginner investors, but it's when is the right time to sell? In this chapter, he's talking here. In general, people hate losses somewhere between two and two and a half times as much as they enjoy equivalent gains. This is a property known as loss aversion. So everybody hates losing more than they love winning. I can definitely attest to this. I've seen this happen before where, you know, when people are much more sensitive to a 5% decline in their portfolio than they are excited about a 5% gain in that same portfolio. But myopia has something to do with this, the short-term focus. Research shown that the more you check your portfolio, the more likely you are to see red or see and encounter a loss somewhere in your portfolio. And it's simply because of the volatile nature of, of prices of investments. The more things bounce around, if you're looking at things every second, odds are you're going to at some point see something that's down and that can trigger that loss aversion. And then you feel, <gasps> you feel a little anxiety there. And if, if we can just avoid the temptation to keep checking our portfolios so often, we'd be better off. Researchers have shown that when people check their performance of their holdings less frequently, they actually invest more. And in all probability over time, that tends to be in their favor. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. If you're, you're, you get that momentum of doing good because you're only looking at it, you're looking at it over to longer time horizons where you're more likely to be doing well because you take out all of the, the noise of the market that that's a great that's a great that's a great way to uh, ensure. Well, honestly, success. looking at looking at looking at our our own clients over the years, the people who have been the most myopic have been the most dissatisfied, the most frustrated, the most um, uh, I, I, I said the most high maintenance, I suppose, clients because they're they're trying to react to these second by second, minute by minute, you know, day by day, week by week results. When they we sat down and developed their plan for, of attack, they're looking at a 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 year time horizon. And all of a sudden last week is like critical to the situation. It really matters to them dr dramatically when in fact it's just noise. I noticed that when people went from uh, paper statements to paperless, so they would go check their account online and it would tell them what their performance was for that day. Uh -huh. That was mobile like, apps is another one. Yeah. Uh, when somebody has a mobile app, it there's, we get a lot more inquiries. Yeah. about what's going on than when they were just getting a paper statement. And there's, there's been research. There's a, uh, I don't know if they still do it this way, but there was a firm. I can't remember the name of the firm. I think they were based in Chicago. They, their advisors would, they would only meet with their clients annually to discuss performance. It's the only opportunity they had to discuss performance. They had very happy clients. Unbelievable asset growth and asset retention and, growth in their assets under management, new clients and referrals from, from that and people that were looking at their stuff minute by minute on apps are the complete opposite. They're just not, it, it's just noise, but it's recognizing that it's noise. And that's the problem. It's that, it's that nearsighted. It's that myopia. The author says, Hey, if I've done my homework and selected things that I think represent good value over the long term, why on earth would I want to sit and watch the performance day by day, let alone second by second? It just doesn't make any sense. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. Process, process, process. So if somebody's if somebody's gone through that process of, like he was saying, you go through the right process, you shouldn't have to look at it that often. So chapter 16 is all about process. It's the one thing you can control. And you think about process, he, he makes a great analogy here. All casino games have a winning process. The odds are stacked in the favor of the house. Do they win every time? Slot machines pay out. The blackjack dealer, sometimes they have to pay out. They lose. They, they don't win every hand. But the odds are in the favor of the house. Every single step of the way within casinos, everything's designed through very specific processes and procedures 
to make sure that the house always wins in the end. They don't try to win. They can't win every single event because otherwise no one would show. It's the story of the person that got rich. It's the dream and the hope that we were talking about earlier that drives people to the casino because there's that, that drama and that wonderful emotion of the big win. There's that noise that you could you can win that one off a couple times, walk out a couple thousands up, maybe 10,000 up. The illusion of control. Days. The yeah. illusion of control. It's all that, there. It's all Everything we talked about here is in the casino, and it's all in the favor of the house. But we can flip that around in our favor by focusing on our own processes. It, again, back to that matrix, good process, bad process on the on on one side and on top you have the columns headings that are good outcome bad outcome two by two if you had a good process a good outcome deserves success good process bad pro- bad outcome eh, it's a bad break but the one fact that, that if you look at athletic teams for example championship organizations reside exclusively in the good process row of that matrix they can't control the outcome. You can't, if you're, if you're running a great hockey team, you can't, you're not going to win. You just aren't going to win every game. But you can win enough. You can win when it counts. All, you have to just follow the process from farm team development to recruiting to practicing, keeping the guys healthy, attracting the right talent, and making enough money to make it all happen. Those are all completely process driven. So for whether it's a casino or a championship organization, what people have to realize, and this is the problem, the the myth that this book talks about, the management of return is impossible. The management of risk is arguable, illusory even says, but process is the one thing we can exert an influence over. The focus needs to be on process and there's not enough. What this book is saying is there's not enough time being spent by investors focusing on their process for decision making to be, like you said, more on the logical side of things, a little more like Spock, if you will. And in investing, outcomes are highly unstable because you have an integral of time. You could be you could be 100 percent right over a five year period and be wrong in a six month period. So what's the difference there? Somebody could fire their advisor, fire their investment manager, sell a stock because of something that just happened over a six-month period when in actuality over the five-year period that actually mattered, they would have been way better off. That's possible in the investment world. Price volatility is going to bounce around way, way more than the fundamentals of your investments. He has some very good quotes on how much prices jump around compared to the fundamentals. It's staggering how much of the short term is right. Just the, the the move and flow of money and people and opinion and it's just noise. No fundamentals. It's noise. Yeah. It's just noise. I mean, you could even be looking. I would argue you could even look out at like a, a almost a three year window, and it's still almost all noise. It's just certainly a one year because the fundamentals don't shift that often. If you're looking at individual stocks like he is in this book here, for example, they only report information four times a year. And and inside of the economy, you're not getting drastic on um, the unemployment numbers or GDP stuff. Yeah. It's not as drastic as, and to date, I haven't seen a lot, any of those data points ever correlate with any future results in anything ever. No, it, certainly not with the, not with the stock market or the bond market. Um, there's, there's, it goes back to, there's a lot of information out there, but what actually matters very little, very little of that information really matters. What you're, you're better off getting down to a process that you can, you can stick with through thick and thin. He goes further. People often judge a past decision by its ultimate outcome rather than basing it on the quality of the decision at the time it was made, given what was known at the time. This is called outcome bias. So again, he, he taught you, you, you uh, sports analogy. Hey, we lost the last three games. Let's fire the head coach. Let's change up the entire leadership of the, of the organization because we lost three games in a row. Would that be a generally a wise decision in the middle of a season? 
That's usually frowned upon. That's probably not going to work. And why, why? So they get a focus on the process. What's going on there? Psychological evidence also shows that focusing on outcomes can create all sorts of unwanted actions. When every decision is measured, and I'm not, I can't go into them. You got to buy the book, read the book, go to the library, check the book out. But when every decision is measured on outcomes, investors are likely to avoid uncertainty, chase noise, and herd with the consensus. If we switch the focus from outcomes to process, things begin to change for the better. It frees us up from worrying about aspects of investment which we can't really control, such as return. Again, you can't control return. Your advisor can't control return. The market gets the vote on that. It's not controllable. Return is unknowable generally and is not controllable. You have kind of a range of expected things over periods of time that you can expect. Like, for example, if you have a 1% CD over a six-month period of time, guess what? It's going to pay 1% for six months. If it doesn't, you got the FDIC that's going to be there to take care of you. But if you're talking about the stock market, knowing what's going to happen next year, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. Knowing what the next five year returns are going to be, also not a thing. I mean, the best I've seen it, that still hasn't been completely proven beyond a shadow of a doubt is a correlation between valuations and future 12 year results or future 10 re- year results. And some of those correlations can be actually quite high. But again, that's not even proof of that, that you have cause and in effect you have correlation not causality or is it correlation not causality it's the best we have to work with if you're trying to do that and it gives you an idea of risk and it might be part of a process but it certainly isn't completely predictive um, but by focusing on process we maximize our potential to generate results simply because a good process tends to lead to good results over time it's just understanding the environment you're in like a simple little process hey if i'm investing I said this uh, in one of the previous episodes. If you have a long-term goal, like 25 years out, maybe you should use a tool that tends to do better over 25-year periods of time. What might that tool be? Generally, in the investment world, that's typically stocks. If you have a goal that's short-term in nature, like I need to buy a house and I have this down payment money, I need to get this down payment money and put it somewhere for the next six months before I buy my house then you should probably use a tool that it has a high probability of not screwing you up over six month time time frames. I don't know, call it a bank account or a CD at most, but you, uh, you apply the right tool for the job. That's all process driven. That's just process driven. And that's what, that's the whole, the whole point behind this. The last piece here he talks about is this conclusion is that everyone starts out with good intentions. So people are listening to this like, yes, I'm, I'm th- this is the time. I'm finally going to draw a line in the sand and I'm going to change this habit that I've had in my head for years. And everybody, uh, I'm going to do my homework. Uh, I have a term paper due in six months. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do one sixth of it every month until it's done. Everybody has this dream that they're going to be all systematic and, and structured in how they do things. And what research has shown is most people don't follow through on their own good intentions. They just don't. We and love so, to procrastinate. We love to procrastinate. Everybody loves to procrastinate. And not only that, they don't. It, it, you may not even procrastinate. You may just never even do it because of habits. Habits are strong. Um, Dan Sullivan from Strategic Coach says, we are all 100% disciplined to our habits. So focus on habits. Procedure. Process. Habits. habits. Process. And the way you can overcome this hurdle if you're trying to make these shifts, if you're susceptible to these, somebody's susceptible to these flaws, these errors that we make, what they say here is it's a combination of rebiasing yourself. Oh, I have a bias toward this. I'm going to rebias myself to this other thing that makes more sense. I have a bias towards overconfidence. Well, I'm going to be more critical in my thinking. Uh, I have a bias to always want to have, take action. Well, I'm going to change that to have a bias to be more patient, maybe sit still or maybe stand in the middle of that goal box so I can maybe have a better odds. It's letting that logical side of your brain work. And then also putting simple rules in place to stack the deck in your favor. What's that? That's preparation, planning, pr- 
prior to when you, you execute your strategy, you need to have those ideas. What if this happens? What if that happens? What are you going to do? What's your plan of attack? Have those rules in place and, and stack the deck in your favor. But you've got to focus on process. That's, that's the key thing in this book. My, my, the key takeaway that I have is without a process, you're going to be more likely to make psychological errors that can cost you huge in your financial world. So take a step back, be more methodical, be more logical. It's a great takeaway. Build that process. The other takeaway I have from this one, because it's resonated with me, is stop telling yourself stories. Build the process and don't don't lie to yourself. That's that's the big two I took away from all. And of how this. do you know? Again, how do you know if you're lying to yourself? You gotta have a process. You gotta have a process. It's like <laughs> one feeds on the other. Exactly right. So I I think yeah that's. That's the end of my notes. I didn't know if you had anything else, but uh, I think I'm, we covered the book. We are we are well into this episode, so uh, you know, Tom. Thanks for joining. Well, thanks for uh, having me. Appreciate pleasure it. as always. And thanks to everyone for listening. Um, we can't thank you enough. We really do appreciate you listening and subscribing and sharing this podcast with others if you find value in it. Um, again, nothing in here is personal advice. If you need that, uh, contact a properly registered fiduciary. We would prefer it was a fiduciary. There's registered people out there that don't act as fiduciaries. But thank you again so much for listening. If you need to contact us on social media, we're at Fierce Fiduciary on most social media. I'm at Brian C. Beasley on most social media. You can find me there. Or um, if you actually want to talk to us professionally, we actually do this for a living. We have a, a, our own company, Athena Private Wealth. You can reach us at athenaprivatewealth.com. Thank you again for listening. And Dan Albert is not here, so I'll say it. Until next time, cue the tiger. <laughs>